Welcome. This is the Into the Wilderness podcast. I am your host, Byron Pace. It is the 1st of February, 2021. On today's show, I sit down and talk to James Glancy. He is a former British Royal Marine turned documentary filmmaker. He's involved in shows with Discovery Channel and National Geographic, and he really has a focus uh, in the work that he's doing now in the conservation of wildlife and the conservation of wild spaces and the science around that. And he's telling these stories through the medium of film. So very much somebody after my my own heart and a lot of the work that I do as well. You can check out all his social media handles and his website by looking at the show notes for this episode. But before we get into that, a week ago, we ran a competition on the podcast that I did with Tyler Sharp, who is the editor-in-chief of Modern Huntsman. And we asked you, what is the front cover of volume six? It's a slightly abstract photograph uh, and not particularly obvious, especially if you don't actually have the book in your hand. And we ask you to send in what it is to the podcast, podcast at paceproductionsuk.com, or just comment on, on social. It's actually been posted on Instagram now. And in a week's time, I will pick the correct answer completely at random, and you will be the lucky winner of the latest volume. So, Go and have a look at the Modern Huntsman website, modernhuntsman.com, or you can go and have a look at my Instagram, which is at Byron J. Pace, and it's the most recent post as this podcast is going out. And tell me what that front cover is, and then you can win your very own copy. Of course, as always and every week, Modern Huntsman are actually our partners on the show, and I am the conservation editor for that publication. There's a lot of really cool things happening and a lot of amazing output uh, and information on their website. So modernhuntsman.com, go over and check it out. Subscribe to the, the mailing list. You don't get bombarded with junk and everything that they send is really valuable information. Uh, so go over and do that. And the very last thing that I need to say before we jump into this really amazing interview, is a big thank you to the Patreon supporters. Uh, you also help make these shows possible. And the top tier supporters this month include Richard Stevens, Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of rdcontracting.co.uk, James Marchington, South Asher Stalking, sorry, the guys at South Asher Stalking, Josh Starling, Thomas Cameron, Mark Zabrowski, and the team at Galax Clothing. If you would like to support the show, there are a couple of ways of doing that. Head over to Patreon patreon.com forward slash Byron Pace, and you can support there. There are a number of tiers. You can also head over to just byronpace.com, click podcast, and you can just make a donation. If you've enjoyed this show, maybe consider it. It really, really helps put these together uh, and make them possible. Uh, but the other thing you can do if you uh, don't want to part with any cash is to just simply go over and rate and review. Uh, we've had a couple of reviews recently, so thank you so much if you're one of the people who have taken the time to write a review on this podcast or even rate it uh, on whatever platform it is that you listen uh, because that helps a tremendous amount to get these in front of other people. And maybe the other thing you could do is just go and recommend it to a friend. Send this podcast on WhatsApp or a text message or some social media chat and tell one friend this week to go and listen to the show. Thank you very much for all of your continued support and I hope that you enjoy this interview with James Glancy. James, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. Uh, we, we've been bouncing around messages probably for about six months, but we've uh, finally, and it's mainly been because of, well, uh, partly my fault, and then you were very busy traveling around because your, your, your day job, amongst many other things, is you're your a filmmaker. At the end of last year, where did you bounce off to? America, I, was it? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. I know you have had some amazing guests on this podcast. Um, yeah, last year it was very difficult for everybody. And I had two films um, to make in the pipeline, one for National Geographic and one for Discovery Channel. And the, um, the, the Discovery Channel one that's filming sharks in Japan got pushed um, and it's been pushed again. So that's a two-year two year postponement. 
And then the the National Geographic one, I managed to get in get a, a permission to go to America, to go to Florida, to go and make a film about bull sharks off the coast of Jupiter in Florida. Um, and that's going to be coming out this summer. But just, that's exciting. The stress of trying to travel at the moment, and it's only got worse in the last week. It really has. So that when was that? Back in a uh, late part of last year, or? Yes, September last year. So what happened was I I was in between making, uh, doing some field tests of a new camera for Sony um, and they wanted sort of um, some some wildlife shots with that and also doing some underwater work. So as a presenter and a a camera operator for for Nat Geo, huge for me because I've never worked for Nat Geo before and it's just one of my... It's like the the golden ticket, isn't it? (laughs) Well, I hope it's a golden ticket. No, I'm sorry. I probably should rephrase that. I mean, I think it is the golden ticket. A lot of people who do stuff for Nat Geo end up doing a lot of other amazing things, but it's like the gold standard of wildlife presenting. That's what a lot of people want to achieve. Be published in National Geographic, be on a National Geographic production or film of some sort. So that's amazing. Well done. Well, I, I, I would say so. I mean, it really was a fantastic experience from everything from the pre-production setting up um, for for the show and then being immersed in the world of bull sharks where we were swimming with 24 surrounded by 24 at one point and really understanding a, a misunderstood species um, and now we're just starting to see um, where well, the rushes are all being edited and the first drafts coming through so um, I, I haven't even seen what, what the product's is but I, apparently it's looking good so i'm really excited and it, it, you know what it's done it's just whetted my appetite to do more with them uh, yeah absolutely i can i can only imagine is it going to be a, a feature or is it going to be a series do you know can you say well no what well, i can say yeah it's for a national geographics shark fest um ah. so, so discovery channel and nat geo have a bit of a rivalry um discovery channel has what's been going now for now is 34 years i think which is um Shark Week, which we all know, we've all heard of, we all love. Uh, but uh, Nat Geo has its rival called Shark Fest. Uh, and what I was doing is a, a sort of scientific deep dive into um, the phenomenon of bull shark aggregation off the coast of Florida. Oh, amazing. And well, can you share a little bit of that with us? Why is it, why is it, why is it, is it a thing that people are talking about? Well, um, bull sharks are... You, you could describe them as being in the sort of big three. In, tame, in the same way as you've got big game, the big five, a bull sharks are one of those big charismatic sharks which grow up to well, maximum sort of 11 feet, possibly 12 feet. Um, they're highly, they're aggressive. Um, and and the, I suppose the headline with the bull shark is they're responsible for a large number of bites, stroke attacks on humans. And okay. because they occupy that literal domain, i.e. They, they can swim into freshwater rivers and they're right along coaches where people, um, they come into contact with people, you, they have become a creature of fascination. So we were looking at the effects of having bull sharks across the coast, but also the effects of climate change. People, the, the question being asked are, are they moving further north as the seas warm? Interesting. And did you? Was there any kind of conclusion? Well, we we were we were, and I can't give too much away on this film until it comes out. But we were also looking for a couple of particularly large sharks who um, have been spotted, and one one may have may have been a record holder. Um, and so that's part of the quest to find out. Also, um, do warming temperatures um, do change in their prey species? Does that mean that they could possibly be growing bigger? Or is there is there a threat? They're actually they're actually in decline, and we're only finding more of them because we're looking for them. So there's a sort of pro, there's a bit of an adventure in the story, but um, a lot of science. And working with um, a Florida University um, and their scientists was really special. I learned a lot from it. That's brilliant. So were you just sort of facilitating the conversation and translating what can be quite complicated science into something that was understandable with your your questioning and presenting? So my background is is military. I was in the the Royal Marines, and and prior and before prior to joining the military, I've always been a diver, a kid that's always fascinated by sharks and animals. Um, and I sort of professionalised my diving qualifications, my skills as a professional diver in the military. Um, and and since I've turned my hand to filmmaking, both behind the camera as a camera operator. Um, doing conservation work and also as a presenter. So I've, I've got into this role of s- supporting science communication, 
um, telling a story through sort of adventurous military means, whether that's sort of parachuting or doing adventurous types of um, potentially quite dangerous dive profiles, but allowing um, us to sort of go go into the world of animals in a way that hasn't been done before because we've got technology or military technology or techniques that can help you um, film in new locations or in in a new way and opening up a bit of science. So my role is really just to help get those scientists into locations or places or situations that would probably be a bit more challenging had they not had a sort of background in the military. I want to pick up from here and and talk about your work with, with Sony and, and how you actually got into this world in the first place. But I'm, I'm going to backtrack because you just mentioned your background was in the military, in the Royal Marines. Uh, t- tell me about that journey. Was that something that you went into straight out of, of school? How, how long were you in? What parts of the world did you find yourself in? What did you learn as a as a person from that incredible experience as being part of a very elite force? It's um it's an interesting one because around thirteen fourteen I was a very very hyperactive kid very difficult difficult time in class um, and I I had wanted to go to RADA and be an actor um, I've always sort of liked communicating in a sort of loud um, loud manner but I, <laughs> and that was always my intention to go to RADA but then I joined the cadets um, and I got and I was very into my sports and through the cadets it actually it just made me realise that you. Um, you know, you can be outdoors, you can have a, a career where you, you use your mind and body. Um, and uh, for some reason, as I got a bit older, it sort of helped my studies. So by the time I got to 16, 17, I decided to apply for a Royal Marine scholarship. So that 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 gave me the, the means to go to university. Okay. Um, and I got, got a place at Oxford. I ended up doing modern history, but that I was kind of tied in. I, it made sense for me to go into the military just um because of the sort of nature of the character I was. When I got to uni in 2001, um, I was asked to do a month of training um, because I was on the scholarship for the Royal Marines. And that was September um, 9-11. And so in that first month of training, I was doing some wow. Royal Marines training and 9-11 happened. So the world completely changed. So by the time I finished my degree, I finished off my young officer training and then went straight to Afghanistan as a 22-year-old. Uh, in charge of 30, a troop of 30 men. Came back, went to Sierra Leone, did an amphibious assault in Sierra, Sierra Leone, did jungle training. And then came back, um, I did some other specialist jobs and then went straight back to Afghanistan for another eight-month tour. So by the time I got to about 24, 25 years old, I spent a, over a year on operations as a commander in war um, and I'd done jungle training and I, I just, it's like, I don't, I didn't have any sort of post university life in London or in a city like a lot of people do. I was just made to grow up quite quickly. Yeah, I can see that. Wow. I mean, that's like baptism by fire, quite literally. It really was. And, and, um, and so that, what it does is apart from making you grow up is what you met, what I realized you missed as a civilian, almost in any job is just having a system that organizes your life. Um, so you just have to just perform when you're when you're on task. But also it continually ensures you're being trained. So that could be anything from parachute training to intelligence analysis. You could be doing language training, dive training, um, Arctic mountaineering training. There is so many environments, techniques, bits of kit that you have to use that, that you are you either training or you're on leave or you're on operations, or that's how it was at the time. So after 10 years, you kind of, apart from the fact that they've given you this military identity, identity and um, you also have been plugged into this incredible training system. Um, and so you do have quite a lot of skills that when you leave, it's hard to find where they're useful, but they are transferable to a number of areas. And, and I found they them to be transferable to both conservation and, strangely, television. Yeah, it's interesting because I know, I mean, my brother was in the military for a period. He was a, a diver in the Navy, a uh, bomb disposal diver, uh, or my, sorry, a mine clearance diver. And I, I know from other friends in the military that it can be it can be quite a jolt coming out just because of all the reasons that you've said. It, it, you're, you're living this very structured, very structured life. Um even as a as someone who's very senior in the military, there's still often structure above you 
that sort of gives you direction. That doesn't exist so much in in the world outside the military. And I think some people really struggle with that. I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I would almost say I would find it strange as somebody that had done um, five years or more didn't struggle to adapt because it's such an institution that really does give you your identity, especially if you've left school or uni and you haven't established yourself as an adult with a separate identity outside the military. When you when you leave school or uni, all your mates and everybody you speak to knows you as either that army or that marine guy. Um, <laughs> and it, gives, but it does, it gives you that, 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 that status. If you played for, if you played rugby for England or you played football for a, a, you know, a premiership football club, you'd be known as so-and-so from Man United or so-and-so for Wasps or England rugby. And so you immediately come with that status. Whereas, you know, now... Who am I not? I'm just James Glancy. And no one ever, you're not, I don't have any badges anymore, really. It's just, that's who I am. And I think the military really gives you that. And you take that away, that identity, also the camaraderie and the fact that they organize you as if you're a sort of a child in some ways. <laughs> um, you have that taken away from you. And it's, it's an incredibly lonely place to be. So how did you how did you make that transition? I mean, well, first of all, I suppose what was your reason for coming out? Because there are, and I have a couple of friends who they're in. For, I mean, certainly in terms of their mindset right now, they're in to the end. They're in for life. Yeah, I guess it's probably not too attractive to leave right now, get in the state of the economy. No, that is very true, <laughs> considering everybody sat at home with no work, <laughs> especially if you're a freelance camera person like we are. Yeah, exactly. It's, this is a pretty grim, grim, grim time for any freelance or business owner. Um, I did three I did three full tours of Afghanistan, uh, and those tours were not admin tours. They were all in command on the front line. So I, I had over, over that, that time any itch that needs to be scratched of getting the adrenaline and doing what you joined to do. Um, it's pretty much like playing three, three cup finals. I didn't have any desire, even though I was scheduled to go back for a fourth tour of Afghanistan. I was a bit disillusioned about what we were doing. Um, and I didn't see myself going for senior command as an officer because it, it, you, you kind of reach a point where you, you get tied into a pension system. So you, d you don't just stay one or two more years, you stay another eight to 10 years, which would kind of leave you leaving at 40. So 30 is a natural jump off point to retrain. And I've, I was always inquisitive about setting up my own business, doing other things, finding myself outside the military. So I think I got to that point after three tours, had enough of going away all the time and thought, you know, there was another world out there. I think this is the time. And that and I didn't need any more convincing than that, um, and so I left to set up uh, a risk management business. And just before we go and talk about that, I just wondered what I'm thinking there as you're explaining this to me is there was undoubtedly very, very good friends and bonds that are probably bonds that can only be formed in the kind of places and circumstances that you will have faced over the previous ten years, who you were leaving behind, and they would carry on living that life. Did how did that feel? Well, both, because 2012 to 13 is a big exodus from the military. Um, that was a sort of deep austerity time in the UK. So there was cuts in the military, but also Britain formally finished the, was formally, form, formally finishing the conflict in Afghanistan in terms of a combat footing. So it, it felt like an end in an era, end of an era, and a lot of people were leaving. That said, I still do have a lot of friends in the units I served in the Marines and I don't think I knew what I was leaving. That's the point. I I didn't know, and I was still seeing a lot of them. I think it's only about a year and a half later I woke up after drinking too much for the millionth time because I just I realised I was becoming unhealthy. I had less structure. Um, you know, certainly drinking more and just a, not. I didn't say I fell apart, but I I had some challenging times physically and mentally because. I didn't know how to structure life, and you and I had definitely lost that that support system, that camaraderie system of always having banter and people around you, all gone. And it I, it really hit me, sort of eighteen months to three years after. It's taken me a long time to retrain and sort of be confident and happy doing what I do as a civilian without that that that, that institution behind me. So what during that period, which just from your brief description 
it doesn't sound like it definitely wasn't easy for you to make that transition. What new support network did you lean on to help carry you through? I mean, that seems like an almost impossible task to do by yourself in your house. I don't, I don't, that, that thing, that, that, that support network is probably the brewery system. Um, <laughs> that doesn't sound like a very healthy support no, network. No, and, and I'll be, I want to be honest, it, it was not a healthy three years, three to four years, um, and partying a lot. I think I was catching up actually, you know. All the things you didn't do. Yeah, at 22, I think my mindset was a bit, a bit more like I was 25, not 33, 34, 35. Um, I, I went out a lot. I, I would say they were fairly fallow years in terms of achieving or building anything, but I kind of did that sort of to find myself a bit. Some, you know, I did lose a lot of friends. Um, I did oversee, you know, I, I was in intense combat. And I think in some ways there's an extended decompression from, from that. Um, and I and I had sort of been on this flirtation with different industries, and the only thing that really caught my attention, or something that I've absolutely loved and I've been passionate about, is is, is animals and wildlife. And, and and that was the one thing I suddenly realised I can fi- I'm fine finding something I'm dedicated to again, like I was dedicated to being in the military, and I lo- I, I always loved every moment of my career. Um, when I started. Um, volunteering to deploy with veterans of wildlife to, to train rangers in South Africa. And that started a new, that and also started to get involved in the, in the, the filming TV world. Um, that's when things started to go right again. You started to find uh, the, the rumblings of a, of a new passion that you could really dedicate yourself to. Yeah, exactly that. I mean, I think there's two ways of of of, of work of working. There's one where you, you you work because you have to, or you work because it's it's a means to earning money, or you're you're somebody that's just passionate about a cause or something, and you do that day day to day, whether it earns you money or not, or you can or you can get by on it. And you know, I struggle to do the former. I have to be interested. I've you know I've got a very active form of ADHD which means I just don't settle unless I'm really really focused on it or interested and you being at the conservation environmental world and filmmaking means you know you're not you don't make films sat at home and you don't conserve wildlife well you can there are jobs you can do in conservation but generally the, the areas that I work in mean that you're out and about and you're very physically and mentally engaged in that activity in the same way as you're physically and mentally engaged when you're in the military so it's kind of sort of finding a new purpose to put, use skill sets, be out and about, and something that's fit my personality that I care about. No, I, I can see the parallels there, and I can see why, if you do have an interest in wildlife, that the the kind of journey that you're on now is where you found yourself. Tell me a little bit more about uh, Veterans for Wildlife and how that that came about for you. So Veterans for Wildlife was founded by former Royal Marines who were from South Africa. There's a lot of um, Commonwealth soldiers that serve in the British Armed Forces. And they did their Afghan day time and then left the military and went back to South Africa and realized that there's huge problems on private and public game reserves in South Africa from poaching and that they had skill sets to to teach rangers to improve um, the protection of charismatic species or or, or just preserve that entire ecosystem. How long ago was that, James, that they set that up? Do you know? Well, they started it informally six years ago. Okay. So the, I think if you if you correspond there, a lot of people did leave around 2011, 12. And if you look at that timeline for rhino and elephant poaching, that was they were terrible, terrible years. So a lot of a lot of former military have got involved in anti poaching efforts from around that time. And but six years ago, they formalized it into a charity. And I mean, it's not been without its difficulties, the charity, but what it has it started off with just mates going out there and helping them train rangers. Then they formalized it as a, an actual UK registered charity and then started partnerships with the Peace Parks Foundation in South Africa, working in Kruger. Then they've been work, the charity has been working in Tanzania, um, uh, working in, with Zoological Society of London and West Africa. In fact, there's a team out there right now with ZS, ZSL um, training rangers to look after um, uh, West Western lowland gorillas. And so it, it's kind of escalated to all these skill sets. And we're not talking about like military training. We're talking things like signals training or uh, evidence-based um, first-person on-scene um, evidence analysis so you can prosecute um, people in the illegal wildlife trade. So it's now 
former police people, um, policemen and women going out to train uh, people how to deal with evidence and make a prosecution. So it's kind of not just veterans. Veterans actually enc- encapsulates the police and intelligence services as well. As well, It's just something that it's grown organically as there's been a demand, as in the illegal wildlife trade, as, um, as you know, is, is huge worldwide. There's problems everywhere at sea and on land. And then you've got these skilled people who are good at operating in difficult environments who can help counter that trade. Uh, and my personal involvement has been was was very much um, as one of the instructors. And now I've started to get more involved operationally with the charity um, to give it a bit more strategy and how we how we go about supporting organisations around the world. Yeah, it, we've definitely seen an escalation in those kinds of organisations. I mean, they are they are one of many um, who do that that kind of work around the world. But particularly in Africa, there's because because of the the level of of poaching that goes on there, particularly for ivory and, and rhino horn, which has been well documented. And I, I just wondered what your thoughts were, and this maybe goes to, as you were explaining there, that this training isn't all like what people might envisage in their head as, as military training, about this idea that this continued es- escalation and militarization of anti-poaching efforts is possibly exacerbating some of the conflict and problem. Uh, it's a it's a really difficult one to uh, sort of mesh in your mind because the immediate reaction is we the, the problem on the ground is if we just look at rhinos for example is rhinos dying because of people poaching them. So let's go and protect the rhinos and we're going to protect them with at least the equivalent, which means we need guns as well. And in some countries, it's a shoot on site policy for poachers. And there are, but there are some people saying that we are spending so much time, and I can understand this thinking, we are spending so much time and resources in just plugging the dam that is leaking, that we're not really getting to the root cause of these problems and fixing them for a long-term solution. Because we can't be in a situation where we just continue amping up the amount of people on the ground and their training level to protect everything that lives. That just doesn't work in the long term. Well, you're absolutely right on every single one of those points. Um, I think the first thing I should point out is that Veterans Wildlife don't actually do anti-poaching. So there are organizations like Vetpol where their people go out and hold guns and do protection. It's, not, it's purely training um, okay. and support. And, and actually, some of it's online now. We're doing online training in, for, um, in Mongolia for the... Um, it is so it's a support role there there are two sides to this i i wouldn't say that um the militarization i e training these people to give them weapons as in the the range of anti poaching forces is is then creating an arms race to increase poaching that comes from demand um but i would say it, your what you've identified there as this whack a mole issue is what we had in afghanistan if you you can you could secure one area but then the terrorists in Afghanistan would just go to another one. And so if you secure one reserve in one part of Africa, they just go to the vulnerable one and they'll just go through that and take every rhino and elephant. So you're not actually solving anything. You're pushing the problem around. The only way I, I anti-poaching has the where, where it, where it is absolutely necessary is to protect a very um, critical species um, to hold the fort whilst we sort out the whole global illegal wildlife trade. It can only be a, a patch. It, and as you say, it's not a long-term solution. So look, for example, um, black rhinos, which are in, they, they number less than 6,000. You need to protect the asset that's there whilst measures are taken globally at, in, international, at an international level at events like COP26 coming up. To stop yeah, in, in Glasgow, just down the road from me. Exactly. We need to stop that. That has to be done internationally through the rule of law. We have to have less demand for all these things. So it's a long term, it's a medium and long term fix to, to reduce global demand and consumption for animal products in general. But you have to, at some point, hold on to what you've got because you can't allow poaching, because the demand's so high, you can't allow poaching at this level to continue. Otherwise, we, we face a situation with the Western black rhino which is now extinct um which was in cameroon um in 2014 the last one was killed we now know there's only two 
Northern white rhino is officially alive, although we think there's some in Sudan, but they're essentially functionally distinct, extinct. The same with um, the Javan and Sumatran rhino. So I think what all you can do is hope to protect some of these species. So, you know, there is enough for when we hope humanity and the global system gets itself in order that they can repopulate. And, and at the same time, we have to educate ourselves to live in tandem with these species. It's not just poaching. It's quite often these animals are just killed because of the human wildlife conflict where people come into contact with them because, the, you know, an elephant will destroy your farm or a tiger will kill someone in the village. And as over, we have increased populations, it's not that they're killing these animals because um, they see their value of them. They see them as a nuisance. And I think oh, closer to home, you can see that in the UK, we don't have any large charismatic animals because 10,000 years ago or so, we started that process of killing them all because they get in the way. So as you say, it's a huge issue. And all we are really doing is providing a few skills to just hold on to some populations of animals in a, in a certain area. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's obviously important because if there's nothing, if there's nothing left to save, then there's no point implementing uh, bigger picture measures. I think the problem in my mind often is that those bigger picture measures, where you're trying to uh, integrate nature and communities is not necessarily happening at the same time and 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 looking at, at the root cause which as you've identified is the actual demand for that trade in the first place and to be fair there have been some i mean there's been a lot of positive moves in the right direction if we look at uh, a lot of the species that you've just identified there, a huge market for that is the Asian market. And we do know now that, that, that pangolins certainly um, have been taken off the the big pharmacopoeia list that is traditional Chinese medicine. So that doesn't that doesn't mean that the illegal trade will die overnight. In fact, maybe it would. You could argue that the illegal trade would increase, uh, but at least it is a move in the right direction. An acknowledgement that we need to an acknowledgement from the uh, sort of uh, the demand inside the Asian market, which was um, uh, seen as okay because it was on their their official list, is now no longer seen as acceptable so i think we are seeing it but changing and i've had this discussion on the pod, podcast before is changing these very deep-seated desires to have something which are embedded in ancient cultures far older than our own cannot be done overnight and we need to view them and treat them with uh, as much understanding and sympathy uh, towards why change is difficult and i don't think we do that enough i mean it's one you know it's very understandable for us to be outraged at the the this illegal market that's going on but to really make change we need to understand why it's being facilitated and just being angry about it doesn't necessarily fix it no absolutely well it's interesting i have to do some studies um <laughs> into that area of um chinese medicine particularly sort of rhino horn and What's strange is that um, those practices of uh, traditional Chinese medicine, particularly pangolin, rhino horn, shark fin, they are they they've always been around, but they were never as large scale as they were. And it's been a lot of clever marketing ploys um, by um, by middlemen or you know clever clever um, organisations have 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 marketed these products to increase demand. So for shark fin's a great one, for example, it, it, it's a status symbol at a wedding. And and as more people are wealthy, especially across Vietnam, it's not necessarily, it's, it's big in China, but it's declined. But it, a lot of this stuff has become a status symbol rather than just seen as something as a healing property. And that and that comes that that comes down to it, not just an increase in population, but an in, increase in wealth. I think that there's, there is two sides to this. There's coexistence with these with species in general. And then there's the demand for illegal wildlife traders as ornaments or or medicine, and uh, you know they are two things that we are. I feel like we're losing ground. I I, I thought I actually previously thought that COVID nineteen might give a break to some of these <laughs> areas, but I had no faith in that whatsoever from the very start. I 
I read all those reports coming out in the first few months of a year ago now about oh, how amazing this is for wildlife, and I immediately called bullshit because I knew that it wasn't going to be the case. Yeah, exactly. And you know, what have what have you seen like now that a bit of time has passed? Like, what is the been the true effect on wildlife that we're seeing as a result of people being vacated from the countryside and these more wilderness areas to their homes? Um. So. In the, I mean, look, in the, there has been some minor positives out of this whole coronavirus situation. One is people value wild spaces uh, and have taken more time to look at the small birds in their garden or, or what have you, and um, and just take an interest in what's what's around them and ecosystems. And I and, and I think that may change opinions. I think it's also show people that. Um, Zoonotic diseases can jump from animals, and that's a potential threat in the future. So people are more aware how a pandemic can begin. Now, even if we don't, we don't know whether it came out of a lab or came from. But clearly, this thing came from an animal. So awareness has improved. Um, I think also what it's shown is things like noise at in the sky and in the sea from shipping. It's shown we have seen whales, dolphins, sharks, all sorts of species. Um, recolonize or come back to areas that have had a bit of a break um whales and seals popping up in harbors um but i think it shows you the effect the effects that we have through transport and logis- the logis- global logistics um networks that we have the f- effects that that has on animals and by giving it a bit of a breather you you it, it shows you how much we affect animals and maybe that will help planning in the future I, I say maybe because um, I know everyone's keen to get back to things um, as they were. So I think what it's done is given us a little bit of a, a view of what 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 could be if we planned more sensibly. But unfortunately, I, to, to, I have to report today that um, I've actually known about this for a while. That Kruger National Park had about ten thousand white, white rhinos in eleven in twenty eleven. Now they've been saying over the last eighteen months that you know they still have the world's largest population of seven to eight thousand. Finally, they've been honest and released the statistics, and it's about three and a half thousand. So a sixty-seven or sixty-eight percent decline since twenty eleven, which is enormous, really, um, and less than five hundred black rhinos. So the, the largest area of uh, the largest reserve in the world has had a sixty five plus percent decline in rhinos in in less than 10 years so we're still not getting it right yeah and now they're like other parks around africa and other reserves and protected areas around the world their funding has dried up and it i remember having this discussion with levison wood back in may last year when he was on the podcast uh, well, probably not May. It must have been probably the summer because we were a couple of months into global lockdown and we were talking about how we have relied. I mean, we're seeing it now. We've relied too much on global tourism as the mechanism for funding conservation because what happens when this this occurs again or there's something else which restricts uh, the, the movement of money tied to tourism? And it dries up and we can't fund these initiatives anymore because that's exactly what's happened. And I know that there are are, uh, people grappling just to be able to feed rangers who are doing um, uh, patrols and protecting endangered species around the world, never mind even pay them right now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we work with ZSL on a number of partners and, you know, Veterans Wildlife has taken a huge hit financially unable to do the classic fundraisers that we do in london that has a knock-on effect on deploying people but we're just a small organization large organizations um have got less money from government grants they've got less money from private donors and a lot of those reserves are um supported by grants have their equipment supported by um, international ngos and charities and then the other piece to that puzzle is, is like you say it's tourists and tourists have two effects really funding and they also act as a pretty good deterrent on the ground when they're driving. People are driving around their game trucks with four to six hundred mil um, camera lenses <laughs> pointing out the side. Um, yeah. That that is that is, a, that is, a, is it's an over patrol essentially, and you're dominating that ground. It means that um, by dominating that ground with with with, with tourists, 
poachers don't operate there, so they're 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 confined to the margins. Um, so you could see that without that that gra- without those areas for people going out, it's, it has also made poaching easier. Um, a lot of rangers have just gone home because they've not been paid and they've got no job security. And then I suppose if you go back to the village, what do you do if you if you've got no job? Um, and you need to feed your family. I, You're going to feed I, your I family. I don't those people yeah. whatsoever. Um, no. It's a big yeah, challenge. It's depressing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it is depressing. Um, but I think it potentially it is the shakeup that we need, which is that we need better long-term mechanisms for conservation. And we maybe need to view conservation in, in a different way. And I think this goes back to what we both mentioned um, maybe 10, 15 minutes ago, which is this idea of integrating people more with nature. And I, uh, one of the things which I am seeing this, well, I'm seeing this battle, and it's not a new battle. I remember you know, back in the 70s when Alistair Graham wrote his book, Gardeners of Eden, he was talking about this, this conservation conflict between those people wanting to talk about conservation in an integrated way uh, bringing people into the the story as part of the a functioning part of of ecosystems, which we always have been historically. I mean that is part of we evolved with all the animals around us, and then this other view, which is this very uh, preservationist uh, ideology in a way, where we have these uh, meccas of conservation where basically people are kept out. I mean, we, we visit them, but we go in on, on, on day trips on the back of, of vehicles and then we vacate them because that's where the animals live. And I can understand how we've got there, but I, I don't see that as a, a viable way for us to go forward. Because I think what we've seen, and, and this probably speaks to um, what you highlighted as this this idea of just protecting these these small areas pushes the problem somewhere else. If we've just got these, in terms of global context of, of land coverage, these very small areas of uh, protected wilderness, for want of a better description, you know, what do we really have at the end of the day? Is that the world we really want to live in? where we have to go and visit places to see what it used to be like? Or do we want to try and formulate a way that we live within a landscape with wildlife? And maybe that is not what it looked like 100 years ago, but maybe that's still the better alternative. Well, I think both in a way. I think you do need to have... You know, you, what you can't do is turn Yellowstone or the Serengeti into a, 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 a inhabited space and think that, 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 that and species will thrive in any numbers. Um, I, I'm all for protecting what remains, but I, I think the model of what you're talking about is join, joined up wilderness spaces where there is yeah. more, it's not rewilded, but it's a wilder spaces amongst our farmland, amongst our, our urban areas, um, and allowing speed animals to migrate, not necessarily migrate, but move, have corridors to move. Um, I think that that comes, that that's a wider plan, which is sort of being investigated in the UK of joining up not that we have particularly many wild spaces, but in between those spaces, making sure our riverways are clean, that, you know, there is not, I think, coastlines clogged up with plastic and ghost fishing nets, that that there is space for nature. And and some um, European, US, well, in fact, most countries do it better than Britain does. Um, if you look at, and I know it annoys the farmers, but they have significant um, or decent numbers of recovering bear and wolf populations in the Pyrenees in Italy. Yeah, uh, they do. Yeah. I mean, a wolf all across Europe, right into Belgium now, um, even up to the outskirts of Paris, which I find absolutely stunning. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, they've got a lot of wolves in France. Yeah, but they still and and they, and they do shoot them. Farmers do shoot them, but they they still manage to get by. That the fact that there are wolves there, and same in America. I know they do shoot a lot of animals, but they 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 tolerate more more wilderness. Um, in the same way as, of course, they do in India and many other places. I do. I, I feel like Britain's actually quite far behind on, on on tolerance of species that we feel that that might change the way we live in any way. Do you think it's because those species that we're talking about, if we're you know we're I mean, 
beavers used to be one of those species, but now they're they're fairly well established. Boar also used to be one of those species, but they're fairly well established now. But when we're looking at lynx and we're looking at uh, wolves and we're looking at bears, they were extirpated from the UK from the British Isles so long ago in comparison, whereas they always existed in mainland mainland Europe. They yes, they found their way back into these countries, but quite a lot of that, although there have been reintroductions and breeding programs. Uh, quite a lot of that has been a natural migration across the continent, whereas at home we have to actually make a, con- a conscious physical effort as humans to bring these species back. And it wasn't; it's not like it was 50 years ago. It was, I think, 14-something or 15-something that the last wolf died in the British Isles. Yeah, Do you think it's a, a, a question of time past? Yeah, I think probably, yeah. Um, time, land, u- land ownership, land usage. You know, a small number of landowners in Britain own everything, and so, of course, have an effect on how how it's run and what it should look like. Um, but yeah, time. I, 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 I'm, I, it's a good, it's a good question, that isn't it? A historical question. Was it the 16th century? I, I thought there was one around the 1600s, uh, a wolf or two that were killed off in Scotland or might be Northern Wales. But you're right. It's so there is no corporate memory uh, in in this country, whereas at least the sort of folk tales like. Red Riding Hood, they came out of Germany a long time ago, but they, they've never lost the fact that there have always been wolves in the forests around Germany and wild boar and a, a variety of species. So we have no way of understanding or tolerating that. No, I, I, I completely agree. That's one of the points of being on an island. Um, why islands can be so biodiverse in some cases across the world, but they but they are very, very quick. It's easy to decimate an island population very. By, by introducing a, a, an invasive species or, or humans. Um I, I am pro re, um, reintroduction, and I, uh, no one really likes using the word rewilding because everyone throws mud at you. But it's been you know, tainted, coming, yeah. <laughs> coming to it, coming to accommodate animals around us and creating space for nature, you know that that is very much part of my my DNA and, and, and what I'm about. But I, I also recognise that um, we have to live, we have to eat, we have to farm, um, and we will never return this country or this this island um, to a state of anything you could call natural we have to have we have to establish a a managed ecosystem where there is space for animals um and that one that will revolve involve a variety of things control control measures hunting controlling different types of species so there is some sort of balance because there's never there is not enough space to have a full functioning ecosystem that you might see in yellowstone or you or you might see in um the Serengeti. I did just go and look up while you were talking when the last wolf was apparently killed in the UK, uh, and it was 1680. You were right in, in Scotland, Killy Cranky, in Perthshire. Yeah, but uh, it's that there are some reports that wolves survive in Scotland up to the 18th century, but those were just you know stories. There was no, there's no record of it. So 1680 is the last um, official record of a wolf in in the UK. It's not- not quite as far as you think, is it? It's amazing. No, I thought it was. I thought it was. Um, I thought it was later than that. I think when you're talking ten thousand years ago. You're talking bears and mountain lions, actually, and even yeah. hyenas. Yeah, it's sort of Pleistocene it's... type landscape. I mean, no one, no but... one people don't realize there were like mountain lions here and hyenas. It's it an incredible landscape when they were the Can forest. You imagine. It was it was Levison Wood that told me, and I didn't have appreciate. I've looked it up since that the last woolly mammoth only died five thousand years ago. Yeah, and rhino. Woolly rhino was found in Scotland. Woolly rhino. Yeah. It's so that, in in the grand scheme of the the Earth's story, it really was a blip in time. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, what? I mean, and that's why um, I'm supportive of these three links that, that they may release as an experiment in the UK. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question that, and it's it's incredibly controversial. The lynx, I, I would much rather be having a discussion about lynx than wolves because I think that I think one of the mistakes of the rewilding debate, and I want to carry on this discussion with lynx with you, um, has been to focus on unrealistic short term targets without doing the kind of honest groundwork which is helping this uh helping the the underlying ecosystems which can support these species really function properly first and fix them and worry about species that we still have 
which are struggling. You know, we, we, it's always conservation is always about resource allocation. If you really boil it down to what are we talking about in terms of uh, implementing change in management, it is what can we do or how should we best use the very limited resources we have. And so there's an argument that why – so this, if we carry on the discussion about links – why should we spend time and money reintroducing lynx when there are a number of other species? I'll pick just two, Atlantic salmon and capercaillie, which we actually have in the UK and we are not winning our fight to help save them. Should we, and, and, and lynx are not struggling. There are, it's, it's Eurasian lynx, so there's lots of them on, on mainland Europe. So putting them into the UK is, is, isn't really actually going to do anything for the species uh, apart from reestablishing a new core. They're doing just fine in many, many countries in yeah. Europe. So it has nothing to do with the species itself. It has to do with the species well, no, in, I, I, in relation the, to the yeah. landscape of, of the UK. But I think, okay, so that's where um, some people get excited about the species as if it's Jurassic Park, and then they become sort of a... a, a, a circus act to come and visit and it does and it will generate a local uh, a tourism and uh, benefit the local economy but the, i i see these species rather than just returning them because it's nice to return them and have them in your area is they should be a keystone species that has a positive effect net effect on the wider ecosystem like bison um or you know and and, and that is the same with we all know the story of wolves changing the, the the course of rivers in yellowstone or most people it's worth looking up if you haven't seen that uh, a a predator will change the nature of gra of grazing species um, and where they graze and that can have a a, a benefit on well all the flora and fauna and within that ecosystem um, whether that whether we are right for that in the uk i don't know i don't know i haven't done the ecological studies but i, I totally agree focus on what we've Got all the, or, or I would say Atlantic salmon is probably diff, a different, a different sort of area of conservation. It probably is, and it's more global actually. But we do have the resources to do to, to do all of it. We we have enough wealth and 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 um, um, capacity and volunteers to do that. So I don't think it's one or the other. But I do think it, it's not a case of parachuting in a load of wolves to make them a tourist attraction. It should, it's got to be done with a wide a wider ecosystem gain net gain. And also in conjunction with the, the community uh, uh, owners, the stakeholders, if you don't have them on side, it isn't going to work. Um, and that's why it is. I know wolves are the sort of the, they, they are the poster poster child, um, but we don't have a Yellowstone space, and that's like a small small cats like lynx. Yeah, fine, but there's loads of other things that are missing or need support. So I'm fully for that. But you were all, the bottom line is is this? It's it's, it's like a, a natural history TV show. What does everyone want to see? They want to see sharks. They want to see lions. They want to see tigers. The, these are the poster boys of, of um, the poster children of, of, of conservation. And they're always going to get the press headlines, the attention, even if they're not as important as, as other species. Yeah, no, that's very true. And it's something that uh, the conservation world has, I was going to say guilty, but they've def definitely harnessed the public's imagination for flagship type species to channel funds in, um, but there there has unquestionably unquestionably been criticism about whether funds, just as you've highlighted, on these more charismatic species that are easier to get a public support behind, is actually a good use of resources because uh, a lot of the more sort of progressive modern thinking actually removes species as individuals as a as the primary consideration and, and it's more about the conservation of ecosystems as a whole which is a, an incredibly complicated and difficult concept really i mean everybody knows the word ecosystems but actually most people don't really understand what that means and what is far more important for long term conservation uh, but also for human well-being, is that we have functioning ecosystems around the world. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we need all of the species that exist in those ecosystems to help them still function. But the fact that we have uh, more biodiversity gives us more red redundancy when things change. And we all know that we're living in a planet which is changing. It is getting warmer. 
And so although individual species may not be the breaking point for an ecosystem functioning or not, the fact that we have greater biodiversity and more species richness within it is like an insurance. And so to your point about bringing back species, I think having sort of integrating these landscapes back where there's synergies between species that would historically have existed together if done in a sensible way where and very importantly as you pointed out where there's communication and an understanding with the local communities that are going to be living with these species that can only be a good thing and i i think one of the problems that we've had is that a lot of these these moves are kind of imposed upon the people, whether we're talking about the west coast of Scotland or we're talking about you know, the interior of Africa. But James, I'm aware that we have been talking for almost an hour already. And it feels like five minutes. And there was a couple of other things that I wanted to speak to you about uh, to sort of go back to the start of our conversation, uh, because it's something that's really close to my heart uh, as well. And it, it's something that I, I fill a lot of my days with, which is uh, filming around wildlife and people and telling different conservation stories that aren't necessarily told. But I never really got to finding out how you picked up a camera for the first time. We, we talked about how you found this as, as a direction uh, to, to really energize a new focus in your life after the military. But picking up a camera and actually making that a career is, is a big move. I mean, there's a lot of, not everybody has it. You know, a lot of people might want to do it. There's a lot of people who th would think wildlife filmmaking, and I don't really class myself as a wildlife filmmaker because I don't just film wildlife. I don't. I definitely don't have the patience to just be a wildlife filmmaker. I, I prefer focusing on the human wildlife interaction. But but not everybody can do it. Not everybody has you know quite what it takes. Uh, how how did that happen for you? Because I'm always fascinated to hear the stories from people who have managed to make that a career, which you, which you have and are doing. I think, yeah, it is a sort of, it's been a, a gradual migration and that there's two, two sides to this. One is sort of organic in that when I was going overseas, um, diving, doing a lot of diving, I was just taking a GoPro and filming stuff and just enjoyed that process and thought this is making me feel as happy as I was in the military. I'm really getting a lot of satisfaction out of it. So I just started GoProing everything, where I was going to a game reserve in South Africa um, or Cameroon or anywhere and just filming. And so I started up, up, up gunning my equipment and improving the quality of it. But also um, at the same time, it was about six years ago, I got asked to be on a TV series called SAS Who Dares Wins. Oh, yes, I know. As one of the instructors. And, and um, I just wasn't comfortable doing um, um, talking about those sort of Social forces issues, and I wasn't comfortable um, about. Uh, I just didn't want to do that. Uh, so the reality style of it, um, but what it did do is make me think about television and how, and all the different buckets of TV from entertainment, arts and drama, natural history, um, current affairs. And I realised that I actually have a huge passion for current affairs and wildlife storytelling. Um, and and so that made what that made me start doing was looking at who produces this stuff, how's it done. I've got a few ideas around sharks because I've always had an interest in sharks and and it sort of it started growing from there realizing that storytelling on television is something that I want to do and I believe I can do but only in a, in a very sort of niche area the other side to it is my father's a cameraman um he's still going at uh, 72 he's probably one of the oldest cameramen in the industry that's uh, amazing so he is a professional cameraman, a war, and he was one of the original war cameramen. He he lived with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in the eighties. Oh, incredible! He, he pioneered being at war filming and doing live broadcasts. So it, I, it has been in my family a long time, and I'd never really asked him about it. Um, well, of course, I asked him about. It. I've always been talking about. It's always been cameras about. But uh, I just started helping him and carrying his tripod to work and cameras, his lights and sort of get, getting on the ground experience um, in the current affairs sector. Um, and, you know, he realized that I was interested and his actually his, his Sony FS7 got nicked for that third time. Uh, <laughs> Where was he that it kept on getting nicked? London, outside the BBC. 
Oh yes. my god! I actually know uh, there's a quite a well-known filmmaker called Philip Bloom. He had yeah. almost all his gear stolen out the back of his car near Richmond only a yeah. few months ago. Yeah. So, he's, and I know who Philip Bloom. I know I know of Philip, obviously. And uh, this is the problem: they do target. They watch where the camera crews are. Um, Dad's wow. had it a few times. So he actually he when <laughs> he got a load of new kits, including A7S II, about six years ago. Uh, and and just gave it to me whenever I was going overseas. So I was quite lucky to have some of my first proper cameras, an A7S II. And I that, that was I used one for years. Well, exactly. So I just I started going from, I went from GoPro to that, and I just made a bunch of rubbish, which I started sending around to production companies who who who, who very swiftly ignored that until. Uh, but it's the diving stuff. When I've been matching my military diving and and filming underwater, and um, ideas about sharks because I I have a, such a keen interest in sharks. I came up with quite a unique idea. I took it to a production company. They pitched it to Discovery Channel. Discovery Channel just had somebody let them down um, with a show that they couldn't fulfill. And they said, okay, let's just give it a go. Let's wow. see. Let's test James out. And so a little bit of right time, right place. Yeah. Along uh, with a great product. Exactly that. But th- there's probably 2,000 unanswered, unanswered emails. I've been had the door shut on me many, many times. I think the persistence... I know this feeling. Continuous practice. So, and I'm still, I'm still starting out, but I've got shows in the pipeline. I've filmed shows. I'm, I'm, I'm progressing. Um, but it's still hard, you know. And it's even just not made any easier by a lockdown. <laughs> Absolutely. So, is that how was creating that early content with Sony stuff? Is that how you ended up also building a relationship with Sony? Because I know that. Uh, you've recently put out some films for them with their new equipment because they're they're releasing new gear at an incredibly rapid rate as they have been doing for the last decade. So yeah, it's hard to understand how they have the capacity to re- release so many ca- cameras every year. They, I reached out to Sony simply to find out when the A7S III was going to be released and if I could get discount to use on one of my films. And they were like, basically, who are you? And then they sort of seeing the st- that I'm doing a sort of a different style of adventurous filming with sharks. And, you know, I did a film with Discovery where I, I was skydiving um, into the into a marine protected area in Palau. And so there's like, this is, this is an interesting way this guy's approaching filming. So they said, would you do a sort of military style run and gun field test with the new FX6? Because a lot of their content creators very much focus on arts and drama or you know, quite urban type stuff. And because the four, the FX6 is a 4K full frame, does 120 frames a second, it's applicable to wildlife. So they said, could you just go and prove that it could be used in, you know, in the outdoor space and get some nice shots? So I didn't make a film per se with a story, but I, I put it through its paces and managed to get, and managed to really get up close and personal, personal with rutting deer with um, wild horses um, galloping in slow motion Um uh, I managed to get a, a fox and a variety of things just to show the beauty and the, and the capability of the camera. And that's sort of, that's been great establishing a relationship with Sony. Um, and now I'm the, I'm an owner of an A7S III. So, so I'm using that in a low light capability for underwater filming. So it's kind of um, making my own luck, being busy, pestering people. I, that, I think it's the only way you can get into this, into this industry. Yeah, I'm I'm very much of the opinion that you've just got to try and make it happen. And as you are creating, it's not just about creating content, though. Uh, but as you are, for me, as, as you're telling stories and as you're interacting with people and people can realize that you have... Uh, you have an understanding and also a passion for what you're doing. It's funny, work does seem to to find you and doors seem to open, although there's not been a lot of doors in the last year because uh, everybody sat at home. <laughs> so, But I think we're, you know, we're all suffering with that. I know some very big names in the wildlife presenting world and I've had the same discussions with them and they've just been like, there's just no work and there's nothing we can do about it. And there's almost, you know, at this point, I, I keep feel, feeling like I should be doing more and I have started to kind of ramp up my conversations and phone calls to try and look at different types of work and stuff for the next year. But to some extent, I, I, I feel like there is a limit to what you can do right now. You could just exhaust yourself because we're kind of restricted and the work that you do, the work that a lot of the work that I do, it really does rely on us being able to go to places to tell these stories. And that has become almost impossible right now. 
Yeah, it has. I've done three things differently being stuck at home. One, online training courses, huge amount of content on YouTube, and you can, you can put it to practice in your own local park. And, and I'm talking about filming and production techniques. You yeah. can just learn from some of the best people who give away uh, a lot of free knowledge or, 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 or subscribe to courses. So I've done that. I also managed to get an environmental wildlife series away with the Mail Plus. Um, the Mail, not traditional conservationists, but they have a, a, a video content channel. And I, I, did a, I did 18 episodes during the first lockdown of something called Planet SOS. Oh, amazing. Which was basically investigating what is going on around the world um, with the environment and how's the coronavirus affecting that. So was your lion piece on YouTube, was that to do with that? Yes, that's the Planet SOS. Yeah. So I was okay. able to phone into reserves, get interviews, um, and then use stock footage, go in my garden, film, piece to camera, and then on a, bu- a tiny budget, piece together like these essentially YouTube-grade content interest pieces about um, what's going on in the environmental conservation sector. I d- and I did, on in lockdown one, I produced from home and filmed from home, and including Zoom interviews, 18 episodes of planet sos and i did two specials on ve day and vj day because obviously i have that military connection so yeah. that's a lot of work it is it, it's it, it, it's 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 helped me learn so much um and it's not the way to produce high quality content but yeah what it did was i was getting interviews with like major indian politicians british politicians because they're all sat at home so yeah, of course i've got boris johnson's dad talking about eight saving the asian elephant so um I so I've been as flexible as I can be within reason, albeit it's all very low budget. Yeah, no, that's I mean that's that's the way to do it is to try and work out how you can fill your time in a in a productive manner, um, but without being and I struggle with this without being uh, stressed about the fact that all these grand plans that I had for career progression have have somewhat come to a standstill. But as you point out, there are other things, and it's maybe it's. Uh, to to you to coin to to use a phrase which is definitely being overused right now you've got to pivot <laughs> you've got to pivot in what you're doing and and do something maybe in a slightly different manner which is clearly what you've done with those um planet sos and also you know, series it's time to read that research paper or that book that you never read and i in terms of creativity hearing what other people have done in their lives or finding out what the latest research is or the latest equipment is that should stimulate new ideas for new anything that new and creative. Um, we spend so much time on planes and going to cafes or going to pubs to see people, and you never really stop um, and to put in that that groundwork. And that it has definitely for me stimulated some new new ideas that I'm, I'm working on for the future. Is there any other projects that you haven't told us about that we haven't talked about on this podcast that you can share with us that you're going to be working on in the future when you're able able to, James? I I, I have some re- yes, actually. So I have some really exciting ones that are sort of um, pitched with the channels we talked about, but they're not greenlit, and they would be just amazing if I get to do those. Um, both behind the camera as a camera operator stroke producer or in front of the camera presenting. So I do sort of a bit of both. But I'm, I've actually just self-funded, I've, I've self-funded, I've raised money to do a separate project, which is to return to Afghanistan um, to film the country through the eyes of Afghan people because this year is the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and um, also the war in Afgh- Afghanistan, the British involvement. So, of course, this is a non-wildlife, non-environmental piece, but it's important for me and I think also for a lot of people just to really understand what happened in that country. So for the first time, I'm sort of using my production camera and creative skills to to, to try and go and fe- film a feature documentary in a war zone. That sounds incredible. James, if people want to follow what you are doing uh, where, where's what's the best place to do that website social media tags etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah i think um i think my my instagram facebook and twitter are probably the ones i'm, I'm most active on it shows it's showing age here because i don't really do tiktok um started don't to, worry i don't i don't either <laughs> and i started to build up my youtube but yeah i think that those, those three are the ones i'm comfortable with i don't i don't think my head can handle any more social media beyond that but i put all my photos and video content on youtube and uh and uh, facebook and uh instagram 
Excellent. Well, we'll stick your your tags for all those places in the show notes. But I really appreciate you taking the time out to talk today. Uh, I know it took a little while for us to hook this up, but it's been a thoroughly enjoyable conversation. And you've actually sort of revitalized my my enthusiasm that has been feeling a little bit depressed with the current state of the world right now. So now I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about all these projects that I really want to do in my mind. So it's been good for me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. Um, I know you've had some amazing guests and, you know, uh, just, to, just, just to share some of the stories. And all I'd say, to, you know, what I will finish with is that I get, I've been getting a lot of really amazing young people that want to get into conservation and filmmaking. And they, they've been getting in touch saying, how do you do this? Um, how do you get involved? It's such a hard world. No one responds to emails. And all I'd say is just keep working at it. Persevere. We've all been through that. Perseverance, practice, and just keep being creative you will you will get a break you only need to be lucky once to get a break and then you can make a success of it well on that very fine note thank you very much james thank you byron